This 22nd Psalm that we're going to read here in just a few moments stands out as one of the most graphically descriptive of the Psalms of Lament. And there's quite a few of those. We've covered a few of them already. Uh, Psalm, later on in the Psalms, we're going to see other Psalms of Lament. But there's a, a graphic description of the kind of trouble and distress that David, its author, found himself in. And the Psalms of Lament are those Psalms that give uh, expression to the dark periods uh, of times that many of God's people have experienced. In this case, David, sometimes it's corporately of the people of God. They give voice to the anguish that they are walking through, these, these periods of trouble. Yet most of these Psalms of Lament express this confident hope, this confident expression of hope that God will rescue and God will deliver. In fact, in a lot of these psalms of lament, the psalmist vows to praise God for a future deliverance. One, he's not seen right now, not experiencing at the moment, but, but confidently hopes and believes will come. And thanks God for answering his anguish cries for help. Now, as we read today's text, you're likely going to pick up immediately uh, that this psalm contains phrases and events that find their ultimate expression and fulfillment in the crucifixion of our Lord. Very familiar phrases. In fact, this psalm begins with the words that our Lord Jesus Christ himself expressed as he endured the depths of agony on the cross. Consider that this is a work of poetry written some 1,000 years before the events of the crucifixion and what they describe It's going to give us a glimpse, just a small glimpse into the suffering of Jesus like no other part of the Bible gives us, with the exception of maybe the Gospels themselves. David, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, conveys something to us that far exceeds the suffering and trouble that he was personally encountering. Namely, it's pointing and conveying the sufferings of Christ on the cross And the subsequent triumph that this psalm expresses here, that David experienced, looks ahead to God's ultimate plan of salvation. The establishment of his kingdom through his Christ and the worship of the nations that are going to pour in and his kingship that will span the generations. I'm going to read the first 21st verses of Psalm 22 and then we will pick up a little bit later the second portion of this psalm. Hear the words of the living God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you are fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. 
O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. This is the word of the Lord. Now, fully two-thirds of this psalm are taken up with David's recounting of a specific time of trouble, a dark period in his life. I mean, that's what we're looking at so far. These are not good times. Uh, These are not happy times that David is telling us about. But what was that period of dark time? We have no way of knowing. Uh, The title of this psalm doesn't tell us anything about a specific time in David's life, but we do know there were many such dark periods in his life. Like there are many such dark periods in our life. Maybe we wouldn't use these particular expressions to describe those troubling moments in life, but I think all of us uh, can sympathize with some of the expressions David gives us here. But whatever that dark period he was going through, it seems intense. Uh, The description of the trouble we just read graphically depicts a level of darkness and distress, uh, but it doesn't seem to coincide with a specific event in David's life, at least not when you read through the narrative of David's life before he became king and after he became king. We don't see an event that maybe rises to this level of anguish and despair and trouble that David seems to be describing for us. We have to remember that this is poetry after all, don't we? He's using poetic expression. You know, when we think of some of the songs that we like and the songs that a lot of artists use, there's a lot of poetic license, right? People who write works of fiction use poetic license to describe things, and there's hyperbole, and there's like exaggeration and vivid imagery, uh, and, and that's what David's using here. But it doesn't diminish the fact that he was walking through troubling and dark times. Now, we're going to reinterpret this Uh, psalm in light of Christ, as he is its ultimate fulfillment. And we're going to see that in the movement from from trouble to triumph in the life of David here in this psalm. Uh, But ultimately, we do need to read this from the perspective of its author, what it meant to the particular author in his time. Uh, That's how we rightly read Scripture here. Now, the psalm opens with this anguished cry from David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, why are you so distant? He expresses here that he's crying in the daytime and this words of groaning and, and, and night falls and, and he can't even rest. He's tossing and turning in his bed. Where are you, God? Why don't you answer me? None of us have ever prayed that, have we? There have been many times in David's life, possibly, that he felt this way. Where he felt forsaken by God. He was beset by enemies intent on killing him. Saul sought to kill him. All of the enemies that surrounded Israel sought David's demise. We already looked at Absalom, his son, who usurped the throne. And David had to flee for his life. Why have you forsaken me? It's an agonized question. I mean, he's perplexed. He's perplexed by God's silence. He's not hearing from God. He's not receiving a response from God. He's disturbed by God's absence in the face of his trouble. Where are you, God? Have you ever prayed that? I think we all have. What David experienced is real. What David feels as he's penning these words is things that we have all experienced. We can sympathize with this expression. Times where God does seem distant. He does seem remote. Where it feels like God has has checked out on us. Where he's been really slow in answering our prayers. We pray and pray and pray. And the answer just doesn't doesn't seem to come. We feel guilty 
We feel guilty because if we really believe in the promises of God, if we're really trusting in God, then maybe we shouldn't feel this way. And, and, and maybe you share that with some uh, well-intentioned uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, and they're telling you, just trust God. You shouldn't feel that way. If you really believe God, you wouldn't feel like he's forsaken you. Yet we do. We, we do feel this way. And I can tell you time and time again, as I've, I've read the Psalms and prayed through the Psalms, I am so grateful that God's Word and these Psalms of Lament give voice and expression to how we honestly feel at times. That we don't have to come before God with pretense. No, we, we, we feel like He's forsaken us. We feel like He's abandoned us. We feel like He's distant and it would be right for us to then ask God, where are you? This is what it feels like. And far from it being something rare in the Christian life, it's a frequent struggle. It's a frequent struggle of the Christian life. We go through tough times. We go through hardships. We go through real trouble and we feel forsaken. There's nothing easy about this life. It's fraught with challenges and many troubles. But we can talk to God like David talked to God. Isn't that good news? Isn't that awesome? We can, we can ask God. We can feel this way. We can express lament just like the psalmist. And you know what's awesome? It doesn't rock God. He's not taken aback. He's not shook up that his kids feel like he's forsaken them. What this psalm points to uh, proves that we are not forsaken or abandoned by God. And we're going to see that. And certainly we are not forsaken or abandoned ultimately in the end. Now there are three specific thoughts that seem to heighten uh, his feelings of God forsakenness. And I want you to see these quickly here. And, and while they're heightening and aggravating those feelings of God abandoning him, I, I think they're also kind of stirring up his faith in a way, a little bit, and stirring up his confidence in the Lord. Uh, first, in verses 3 through 5, he, he recounts the faith of, of his ancient fathers. He says, they, they trusted in God. They cried out to God, and they were delivered. The holy God, the holy one of Israel, that God had not failed those previous generations of saints. So why does he feel this way now? Secondly, in verses 6 through 8, he recounts the scorn and mockery of his enemies. He says they make him feel like a worm. Because I don't even feel like a man at the moment. I feel like the lowest of the lowliest of creatures, a, a slimy worm. That's how my enemies make me feel. They mock me. They scorn me. They jeer at me. And they say, well, he trusts in God like his fathers did. Why isn't he rescuing him now? And David's wondering why his experience isn't like his father's. For he trusts in God. So they taunt him. Let him deliver him. He trusts in the Lord. Will God allow them to continue to blaspheme him by his silence or apparent silence? And thirdly, in verses 9 through 10, he declares that Yahweh has been his God from the womb, from the birth, he was set apart, devoted to the Lord. Yahweh is the one who made him to trust in him from the time he was nursed. How could he abandon him now? So these thoughts lead him to make his appeal, his plea to God in verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Now, I don't think David lost his faith. And I don't think many times when we feel abandoned or forsaken by God or that he's silent, that we necessarily have lost our faith. But, but this troubling situation, whatever it is, has left him disoriented, discombobulated, right? Depressed on the account of the fact that God is seemingly absent. And that's exactly our experience in troubling times when we feel God forsaken. It's disorienting. 
when we think of how God has just so gloriously rescued us and saved us, when we, when we think about our salvation and what God has brought us through, and then we get hit with something hard. We, we get slammed so hard, and it is so jarring to us, and our faith is tested. And we could feel like this, like God is distant and, and silent. And, and our thoughts could be like, well, God, we, we've seen you come through for others, right? Why not me? I, I've seen how you brought this so-and-so through their troubling situation, Lord. But what about me? Or we might even say, God, you've done it for me in the past. Why not now? Why am I not experiencing that in the moment? We have people around us who don't follow Jesus, who mock our faith, who delight in maybe seeing us suffer and go through hardship because we follow Christ. So why would God remain silent and let them blaspheme his name? We can readily identify with David in his trouble and his feelings. Now, in 12 through 21, and we won't go through those particular scriptures there other than to say, what we find here is David describing his enemies in great detail. And, and he's describing the physical, mental, and emotional suffering he's enduring at their hands. And, and the way he depicts his enemies is with this animal and, and imagery here of, of, of bulls and dogs and lions and then Lastly, he talks about uh, the, the company of evildoers, right? The, the metaphors he describes uh, of them as ravenous and bestial and powerful and savage and with, with lethal weapons ready to inflict harm upon him. His enemies are all around him. They encircle him. They encompass him, gloating and mocking and sneering, humiliating him. His physical strength is gone. He's like a broken piece of dried up clay, dehydrated, weak. His tongue is cleaved to the roof of his mouth. He is parched. He's so emaciated that he can even count his bones. His heart is failing. He's emotionally tapped out in extreme agony and near the point of death. That's pretty intense. That's severe. And in verses 19 through 21, we find him pleading again, Yahweh, do not be distant. You are my only hope. You're my only help. Come quickly. He's asking for deliverance from his enemies. And we pray those very same things. Lord, you're my only hope. Lord, you know this situation. You know this trouble. I feel like you're distant. I'm, I hope you're hearing me, God. You're my only hope. You're my only way through this. Respond and come quickly. Now, that's the first two-thirds of the psalm. It's, it's a lengthy lament. But there is a dramatic, sudden turn that takes place in this psalm here. The whole tone of the psalm shifts completely from, from trouble to triumph, from anguished prayer now to just this uh, exuberant praise from the mouth of David. And I want you to see this right there at the end of verse 21, that second portion. We read it. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You've rescued me. How? We don't know. He just rings this triumphant note. He expresses it in the past tense. You have rescued me. This is what I was walking through. This was the trouble, but you delivered me. You rescued me. You answered my prayer. No indication how it came about. Just did. It just did. And in 19 through 21, in that portion we just uh, looked at here of how David describes his enemies here, I want you to see this, this great reversal that takes place in how David experiences um, his deliverance. And it's just a beautiful work of of poetry in, in how he does this and expressing his triumph. Uh, I'll just look at this quickly. Verses 12, um, verse 12, he describes the many strong bulls that encompass him. In verse 13, he describes the ravenous roaring lion that's ready to devour him. 
In verse 16, the dogs encompass him. And in verse 16, the company of evildoers pierce his hands and feet. And then in reverse order, he describes deliverance. Deliver my soul from the sword, right? From the evildoers. Verse 20, deliver me from the power of the dog. 21, save me from the mouth of the lion. And 22, you rescued me from the horns of the wild bulls. Glorious, glorious deliverance took place. Now let's look at the remainder of the psalm here, picking up in verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. And stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. For He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And He has not hidden His face from Him, but has heard when He cried to Him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear Him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. That is so amazing. David felt forsaken by God, calling out to God and and, and, and not getting an answer. But at the end of this lament section, David can say, you have answered me. You heard and you responded me. You heard when I cried out to you. In the end, God had not despised his afflicted servant, David. Even as we saw in verse 6, he was despised by his enemies. Verse 22 through 25 David declares that he will praise God's name in the midst of the congregation. I love this. Like he's not going to keep the good news to himself. He's going to praise God not just privately, but publicly. Like all of Israel will hear how God rescued him and delivered him. They will hear David praise God for his salvation, bearing public witness of God's deliverance among his own people. Now he's taking his praise public. I love that. There's this, this, this element here that of those who've experienced this glorious salvation and deliverance, right, can't keep it to himself. David cannot keep this to himself. And he can't even conceive of praising God alone. He's going to show up in the midst of the people and declare the praises of God and God's salvation and deliverance. And he's going to exhort all of his fellow sufferers and fellow afflicted to seek God. And to praise God because God has not hidden his face from then. And we also bear this, those of us who've experienced salvation, bear the same missionary impulse here. To publicly proclaim and praise the salvation of our God. In fact, in verse 23, he commands the people of God to praise God. God's people are commanded to praise Him, to glorify Him, to stand in awe of Him. It's a command. How much more we who've experienced salvation through Jesus Christ should be praising God? Not in the secret place, not in our little prayer closet, not in the privacy of our homes, but publicly in the congregation of the saints and publicly everywhere We are and everywhere we go. Because this is what David now begins to look to. He takes on a a prophetic role. There's a forward look now at the end of this psalm to the conversion of the nations. Because the worship of Yahweh grows ever larger. It starts in the congregation and it spreads to the ends of the earth. The circle of worshipers ever expanding until all the families of the nations of the earth are worshiping 
the Lord. David there declares, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. This is the everlasting and universal dominion of Yahweh. His eternal, everlasting rule. And David's posterity will continue to herald the good news of Yahweh's salvation and righteousness to subsequent generations. To generations yet unborn, they too will praise him. Seems like the goal of this psalm for the people of God, for Israel, right, in their history, was to praise the Lord who just led his anointed king through whatever trouble he was going through, like to experience this great salvation and deliverance and triumph that will eventually lead to all the nations worshiping the Lord. Now, that didn't happen in David's time. So this is pointing us to something else. So we looked at the trouble David was in. We looked at his praise of God's deliverance for the triumph he experienced. And now I want us to look at the telos of Psalm 22. The fulfillment, the goal, the end, the ultimate end of what this psalm points us to. The greater fulfillment in Christ Jesus. Now we've seen this repeatedly in all the psalms. All the psalms point us to Christ. Indeed, Jesus himself said that that's what the psalms do. Point us to Jesus. Everything in the psalms, right? Um, so we've seen this pattern of David's experience foreshadowing the pattern of experience fulfilled in Christ. And hopefully as we read this psalm, if you weren't familiar with it, as we went through that first part, you would see that the quick application to Christ's passion, to his suffering at his crucifixion, his suffering in agony on the cross. But we can't just read it just applying this to Christ's suffering because we also see the subsequent glory expressed here at the end of the psalm. The triumphant victory at Christ's resurrection and his ascension and the manifestation of God's end time kingdom with all of the nations worshiping the Lord. This particular psalm is the most quoted psalm in all of the New Testament. Now, Psalms is already the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament, but this particular psalm is the most quoted psalm. Over 22 times, this psalm is alluded to or referenced, mainly in the Gospels, but about Jesus. Luke twenty-two forty-four, 44, Jesus said to the two disciples that he had encountered on the road to Emmaus, and then he, he unveils himself before their eyes, but he tells them that everything written about him in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. So when we look at this particular psalm and we see the, the parallels and the correlation to the, to the suffering of Jesus, his passion here, we have to interpret this in light of the suffering and glory of Christ. Whatever David's experience was, when we read this psalm backwards from Christ, we see that David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this psalm in such a way to convey something far more significant than whatever it was that he was going through. But whatever he went through, whatever trouble it was, there's in no way warranted the graphic and vivid description that is then applied to Christ at his crucifixion. How else could we explain all of the prophetic detail found in this psalm and then fulfilled in Christ? And I love portions like this because, once again, it gives us evidence of the authenticity of scripture. This was a thousand years before the crucifixion, a thousand years before David even knew. Nobody even knew what crucifixion was, Roman crucifixion. Yet, there's this prophetic account given for us. And I want us, and the best way for us to see it is to see it in the gospel accounts themselves. Uh, in verse twenty-two, eighteen, 18, David writes, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. I don't think that really happened in the life of David. But he's using this language to express the humiliation he was walking through and encountering. But look how John sees this. John 19, 23 and 24. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. For it to see whose it shall be. We also see Matthew and Mark uh, reference this as well. But look what John adds. Look at this note. 
This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Verse 7 of Psalm 22 All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. And then in Matthew 27, 39, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. Matthew's not the only gospel uh, writer to reference that. In verse 8 of Psalm 22, he trusts in the Lord. Remember, this is the mocking of his enemies. He trusts in the Lord. Let God deliver him now. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Matthew 27, 43, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. Again, this was the Lord's enemies encompassing him all about. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And then we find the words of the first verse of Psalm 22 on the lips of our Lord as he hung in agony on the cross. Now, Psalm 22 would have been very familiar to Jesus. I mean, he would have sung this psalm as a young boy. In fact, if you look at the superscription of this psalm, it's sung according to the doe of the dawn. That was likely a a particular tune that this song was sung to. Now, I know the gospel writers say that Jesus said these particular words. In fact, he, he, he quotes Psalm 22, 1, but in Aramaic, which was the language that Jesus spoke. But it was this psalm that was on his lips and on his heart and on his mind in that very moment. Matthew 27, 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about the crucifixion scenes and the words of David's there in Psalm 22 and what we know of those scenes in the gospel accounts. Verse 16 of 22, a company of evildoers encircles him and they pierce his hands and feet. Now, we don't have a direct quote in scripture about this particular psalm. We do know that is exactly what happened, right? Christ's enemies surrounded him at the cross and they pierced his hands and feet nailing him to the tree. In verse 17, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. As Jesus hung on that cross, stripped and naked and put to shame, his body stretched out, his flesh hanging from his body as it's flayed open from the repeated scourgings, his bones exposed. In all of that, with a mocking and jeering crowd staring and gloating over him. The writer of Hebrews quotes from verse 22 of Psalm 22 and declares that this is about Jesus. And you can read that on your own there in Hebrews chapter 2. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is acquainted with suffering like no one else. Isaiah declares that God's servant will be a man of sorrows despised and rejected by men, afflicted, pierced, and crushed. No one could express that kind of anguish and experience the kind of agony and anguish that Jesus did. Yet David expresses that prophetically, and we see its fulfillment in Christ Jesus. But Jesus didn't just suffer. The psalm is part lament, but it also is part triumph, right? There is glory on the other side of the suffering. Jesus suffered, and then he was glorified. Jesus suffered and then triumphed and is victorious over death death and the grave. More than that, he ascended and sits on the throne of glory. What is he doing now? He's reigning. He's ruling in fulfillment of God's covenant with David. You recall that in 1 Samuel, God made a covenant with David, an unconditional covenant that David's offspring would sit on his throne and his kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom. And his kingdom now is expanding as the gospel is preached and proclaimed. That's what makes Jesus a marvelous Savior. Savior. 
one who is worthy to be praised by us continually for our salvation in him. You and I get to join in this praise chorus of the Old Testament saints. As David commanded them to praise God, glorify God, and stand in awe of him, we continue in that same stream today, an endless chorus of praise that continues until we will behold with our own eyes what John, the apostle of the Lord, saw in his heavenly vision. I want you to see this in Revelation chapter 7, a familiar portion of Scripture to many of us, verses 9 and 10. But John sees what David describes looking out ahead at the end of Psalm 22. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. And that's what John saw. And that's what David saw. As he's, he is seeing this through the eyes of the Lord's anointed, his royal descendant, the Messiah. You and I are going to have trouble in this world. You and I are going to experience exceedingly difficult times. We will feel disoriented, depressed, just like David, feeling like God has abandoned us. God has forsaken us. God is distant. God is not near. God isn't hearing our prayers. But we're never truly abandoned. We're not really forsaken. And we're not ultimately forsaken in our trouble. For one day, we will enter into our everlasting triumph, the triumph that Jesus secured for us. In John's vision there, I I just want to read the last portion of that in in Revelation chapter 7 because it ties so well to what John saw and wrote about in Psalm 22. Revelation 7, 14 through 17. Therefore, they, this is the multitudes worshiping, from every tribe and language and nation. They're before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They're not forsaken. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from Their eye, never forsaken, but forgiven, clothed in Christ's royal robes of righteousness, sheltered by God so that we could worship him and praise him from everlasting to everlasting because he is God and God alone.